I just want to say, Brenna, welcome to the show. I am excited to have you. I am so glad that we got connected. And from the very first time we had a conversation, it just felt like meeting a kindred spirit. But for those who are listening in, they would have heard the introduction, what you're about. But I'd love to hear it in your own words. How would you describe what you do to somebody who's never heard about you? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I just, I feel exactly the same about you. I love the similarity in our viewpoints and our work. And I just, I'm really appreciative that we're having this conversation today. So thank you for inviting me. Um, how would I describe what I do? So World Changers Media is a publishing company focused on work by and for the new generation of thought leaders. But I think we do a little bit more than that. So um, we're not just taking manuscripts and producing them. We are helping our authors fully develop and execute on their biggest visions and ideas. Mm -hmm. So really what I think, you know, the better way to describe what we do is, is the care and feeding of big ideas. There's a growth process inherent to developing high quality, impactful content. There's so many questions I have to ask you in there, but there's another one. There's another short story that I'd love for you to share that is, would be a very near and dear interest to the kind of people who like to listen to the modern consultant. And that's actually the reason why we needed to record today versus when we were thinking about recording, like, I think like one or two weeks ago, what is the big fantastic update? Well, I can't share too much, um, because of, of privacy requirements, but, um, two and a half weeks ago, my husband and I, uh, took custody of our 12 month old foster son. It was, it happened very quickly. It was very unexpected, but, um, it has been an absolutely lovely journey, and we're super excited to be working um, with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, DCYF, here in Rhode Island. Um, it just unfolded so beautifully and also has been wreaking havoc with my schedule, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. There's there's nothing like family to uh, wreak a little bit of uh, uh, chaotic good uh, on our schedules. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, it's it's a huge requirement for presence. There is no more multitasking. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our two girls are, are old enough that we were kind of able to lean back into that busyness. Um, and then we got pulled right back out of it, which is a blessing for sure. It's, it's really timely because we recently redid our website and did an entire brand refresh. And one of the things that came out of that brand refresh was we, we looked at like past 20 clients that we had worked with. And we noticed that over 50% of them, uh, the whole reason uh, they were doing, growing their service-based businesses, trying to launch higher ticket courses and all these things is uh, so they could spend more time with their family. Like, how's it? Uh, that was the driving reason, you know, and uh, I'd say 90% of the time, any time a client has had to reschedule a call with me, it's for family. Like that's, that's it. Everything else like, uh, usually takes a back seat, but family uh, takes a front seat. And so when you shared with me, um, why I was like, yeah, that tracks. <laughs> like, <that's, laughs> you're in good company. Uh, you're, you're perfectly fine. Just in my own story. Last month, uh, I immigrated my parents uh, to the United States. Um, oh. Yeah, it's it's it literally a, a, a life milestone that's been in the works now for half a decade. That is amazing. Congratulations to you and them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's 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 been a dream of mine for a very long time to bring my family uh, closer together. You know, and uh, it's uh, we are we're one step closer to doing that. And then just a couple of weeks ago, we were able to celebrate my dad's uh, 70th birthday um, as well. And so that was just a beautiful life milestone. And as uh, as 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 fate would have it, uh, the green cards came just a couple of days before my dad's birthday. 
And I was able to surprise him with it right there at his birthday. He had no idea it was coming. And it, it was it was amazing. Can I bounce on my yoga ball chair? It's like, <laughs> <"Nah, I'm okay." laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was so crazy. beautiful, Mark. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It just, it just gave, uh, gave a lot of life and energy to all the things that I've been working on for a long time. And again, very thankful. And also, you know, I'm even just more excited to help more people, you know, um, spend more time with their family. Cause like, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. That's not, you know, it just, uh, it just really, it really, uh, it, it helps when everything is in alignment. Um, I find, and people know that, Hey, yes, we're doing all of this work, but the work has purpose. So. Yeah. And I, I know for me that it's been tempting at times to forget, um, that, how the impact that we have at home is more powerful than the impact we have on the masses. And I think that those of us who are, you know, big visionaries and we have a really strong call of purpose and, you know, being change makers and industry disruptors and, um, you know, it can be tempting to forget that the little things at home are, are also so important. And, um, I know that when I forget that, when I get caught in the big stuff and the big picture and the five-year plan and the 10-year plan and the, you know, the, those big visionary components, it, um, my life inevitably feels imbalanced and unfulfilling. Mm -hmm. Not that I don't want to continue to work in that vein because that is my sweet spot, but if it's not grounded in who I'm being at home and you know, how I'm raising my kids and the relationship that I'm having with my husband, it, it doesn't feel fulfilling in the same way. I, I, we literally, it's literally how we start and end the day, you know, every day, you know? And so, yeah, it 1000%, it's going to have such a huge impact on all of the things that we do in between the start and the end of the day, like 100%. You know, and I'm also super curious and excited to talk to you about that middle part of the day where you spend so much time uh, helping others get more of their message out to the world because there's such parallels between our worlds. I help people turn their expertise into courses that can have a life changing impact, and you help people turn their stories and everything that's inside of them into books that um, reach and impact the world. I would love to hear how you even decided to focus on that versus say fiction or, you know, there's so many different subgenres of writing and putting writing into the form of a book uh, that one could go down. How did you get to land on this? Um, as most things that are destined and that we're sort of built into our life plan without our human input completely by accident. I mean, or that that's how it seems. Um, you know, looking back, I can see that it was no accident. Actually, you know, fiction is my play space. Growing up, I read nothing but fiction. In my spare time, I still read nothing but fiction. And I developed a huge appreciation growing up for how stories can really change the way we view each other and the world. And I really do think that there are amazing fiction writers out there who are changing people's relationships to society, to each other, to themselves through their storytelling. The way that I ended up in nonfiction was that um, when I, I quit my job at, uh, I was a master stylist at a hair salon mm. and uh, I didn't go to college. I, I went to hairdressing school instead. And I had been working in that field for about seven or eight years, and I loved it. It taught me how to, you know, how to talk to people, but mostly it was this beautiful way of helping people see the best in themselves. And that was what I really valued about the work. I found that it wasn't stimulating my brain in the way that I wanted to be stimulated. Um, and so I quit my job and I basically hung a shingle on my door and I decided that I was going to start my freelance writing company. This is 2005, 2006. 
I knew absolutely nothing about the industry. I had always been a writer and an avid reader, but I had no formal training. And so I started taking whatever projects came my way. I ended up um, getting in touch with a local book coach here in Rhode Island. Her name is Lisa Tenner. I always credit her with my start. She's actually one of our authors now, which just feels like mm, such a beautiful yeah. full circle moment. Yeah. Um, and she really liked my work and started recommending me to her clients for editing and ghostwriting. And she just happened to have a majority of her clients in the space of transformational nonfiction. So mm. self-help, personal development, um, forward thinking medicine, you know, it was, it was that kind of work. And what I saw there was a way for me to continue what felt most important to me about my earlier work, which was helping people find the best versions of themselves. And coincidentally or not, um, I was also on a really deeply personal journey of healing myself. Mm. So all of the work that I was receiving was exactly what I needed to learn in order to become who I wanted to become. And uh, it just became sort of my specialty space. And I think that it was a really beautiful synergy and it was completely unintentional. <laughs> I started editing because I wanted to be a better writer. I started editing because I wanted to learn the craft and it just so happened that that was the, the space that I was dropped headfirst into and it was exactly where I needed to be. That is wonderful. I really love how you shared the deeper impact of how style, personal style, self-care uh, just really impacts the, the inner self, you know, the outer impacting the inner and then the inner impacting the outer. There's so many uh, stories uh, within that in so many different areas of life and then hearing how that now evolved into, you know, fiction and then nonfiction and I really liked how you described that, you know, transform, transformational nonfiction. And that really uh, stuck with me because it really captures uh, just what it is that everyone in that space is trying to do. What would you say to someone who maybe they already have a course, you know, and they're thinking, huh, I want to write a book, what is the process for being able to transfer what's already uh, in the form of, you know, uh, an online course into a book? What are, what are some of the parallels? What are some of the challenges they might face? How does one begin to even think about that? Well, I think that there are a number of parallels in the way the content is structured. Um, we can get into the logistics of that in a moment. I do think that books are a unique medium because they are an immersive experience, um, very much like courses where there's multiple senses involved, especially if people are reading paper books. Mm. Um, however, I think that there's a different approach that people take when they're engaging with books. Like when you're engaging with a course, you're doing so generally in a format where you're alert, you're paying attention, maybe you're actually executing on uh, the suggestions as you're listening to the course. There's a there's more of a, you know, I'm here to learn mm. and I'm here to have an experience of learning and I'm here to solve a problem. Uh, yes. Most people, when they pick up a nonfiction book, they're in that mindset. But when they start reading, there is an immersive quality that happens, particularly if the stories are really good. Yes. And it's the it's the experience of diving into someone else's word words and hearing their voice, whether it's your imagination of their voice or actually hearing their voice in an audio format or you know some mixture of the two. Um, it's like they're they're speaking directly to you, but your brain is free to imagine all of the different scenarios that are being described. And so there's an imagination component that gets brought into it. And what I find is that story is the best medium out of any medium for teaching people some sort of lesson. It's mm. ingrained into our human development. Story has been, been used as a teaching format since basically the dawn of humanity. And the reason it works is because story evokes emotion. Mm. 
And when we have an emotion attached to information, we are much more likely to remember it. You know, you're much more likely to remember a piece of information from your high school history class. If there was a funny moment with your teacher or some sort of funny anecdote that they created or um, some sort of profound story that was told that related to the material at hand. Like if you think about the moments you remember from school, it's always that, right? There's some sort of uh, emotional component that made your brain go, oh, pay attention to that information. And so the reason I love the medium of a book so much is that people get to immerse themselves in a story and then the information is tailored to reflect the story and the lessons of the story. Mm. And so there's an emotional, oh my God, I felt like that before. Oh, wow. I really, you know, Mm. like I I remember something like that happening to me. And then you're engaged. So when the information is presented and you're imagining it playing out in your mind, depending on what kind of learner you are, that may look different. Um, But there's now an attachment to the information. And so I do find that when books are well-crafted, they take all of the best elements of courses, which is all of the beautiful, well-ordered learning, and they pair it with this emotional component. And there's not a lot of other formats where you can do that in a way that people will engage their imaginations with, right? So, yeah, and the engagement of the imagination is something I think is is kind of undervalued. Um, it's, you know, it's when we are playing out scenes in our mind that aren't actually being directed to us, um, it becomes more ours. And this may not be true for everybody. I know it's highly true for me. Um, and I know that it's highly true for a number of people that I've spoken to about this over the years. So... When we're talking about, you know, the value of books, I see books as a gift from the author to their audience. Yeah. Here, I'm going to give you this gift of my words, of my energy, of my story, of my emotion, of my content, of my expertise. And you now get to spend 10 or 15 or 20 hours sitting with me in this place mm-hmm. at your own pace. You know, whether it's on the beach or reading in bed at night or whatever it is, but you're in this intimate space with them. And I don't know about you, but anytime I hear people talk about their favorite authors, it's like they're talking about their best friends. You're right. Yeah. So I think that if there's a, there's just something special about books for me in that way. And are they learning tools? Yes. Yeah. Are they emotional connection tools? Yes. Um, are they, um, more useful for some consumers than others? That is also true. If you're a visual learner, video may be far easier for you to digest than a book. Um, you know, if you're a kinesthetic learner, reading an actual paper book is a great way to cement those memories because you have multiple Mm. senses engaged. If you're an auditory learner, right? Audio book. But, um, but there's, there's just something to be said, I think, about um, the deep relationship that can emerge from that volume of content mm. put together in one package. That sparks so many different conversation threads for me. And one in particular that stood out is story being a vehicle for the uh, listener or viewer of the story to be able to have this emotional resonance that is not directed at them but allows them to participate in the story and the thing that came up in my mind in response to that is a little bit of knowledge from the world of direct response copywriting because you know sales persuasion understanding the uh, behavioral psychology behind what makes us bind all of that and when we're constructing sales arguments. There's a lot of care that's uh, taken, particularly in the writing of a sales page, to not attack the ego. Uh, to there's there's because then defense mechanisms go up, and then now they can't hear 
uh, anything, they, they, the, the learning can't take place. You know, a behavior change that they take ownership of uh, can't take place. And if it does take place, then you're usually bridging into the world of manipulation. You know, it's like, oh, I, sp I, I, I triggered these emotions so that I can cause this reaction for you to then have to take these actions. Um, however, if you're going to do it in an ethical way, typically there is some element of story uh, involved and particularly a telling of story uh, to be able to show empathy, basically, and to, you know, show that you're on someone's side and to be able to have a shift in paradigms to be able to explore why past situations or pathways didn't particularly work out well and to point out the uh, maybe potential errors in uh, logic uh, or how one's uh, 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 worldview on a particular subject shaped their actions and then their outcomes uh, and then to show them that there is an alternate pathway and that then giving them the option to choose because then if they choose they take ownership of it uh yeah that's what that's just one of the threads that <laughs> got sparked for me within what you shared well i mean i think it's it's quite simple when you think about it there are infinite possibilities for situations for problems that need to be solved for um you know obstacles that can be surmounted but our range of human emotion is actually fairly, I'm not going to call it limited because it's limitless, but the names that we have for emotions, the feelings, mm. there's probably, you know, a, a dozen sort of key feelings, you know, that we can all relate to in some way. And to me, the, the most powerful use of story is the thing that, that makes great fiction writing brilliant. Right. And the thing that makes great nonfiction writing brilliant is our ability to create a resonance emotionally, not to manipulate, not to not to cause an action, but to create an imperative for the information that we're about to deliver. Huh. So the information delivered in story is simply an emotional roller coaster ride, right? Like you think about your favorite fiction books. Um, we get to we get to be someone else for a little while. We get to ride through this spectrum of emotion that we're longing to experience. And we choose, we all have different story preferences because of the range of emotion we want to experience through story. In nonfiction, I still think of it as what in the, the sci-fi fantasy world they call world building mm -hmm. um, because you're still building a world to bring someone into. It just so happens that that world is your world. And when you invite people into your world and you allow them to experience the emotion of whatever your sort of driving forces, right? Your life experiences, your clients' experiences, right? People who are having the same problems that your readers are having, and now they've gone on this emotional arc and they're someplace different, right? You allow people to experience that and then you're like, okay. Do, do you want this? Is this important to you? Then I'm going to show you the way. Hmm. And at any point, and this is where I think, you know, we can get away from, um, you know, that sort of forceful manipulation that sometimes happens in misaligned marketing is that at any point the reader can say, I don't feel that way. And it's okay. The information will still be relevant, but it will stick more if the author has done a good job of creating empathy, of creating resonance, of creating um, a shared experience, even if the person reading it has never had the physical experience that the author is describing. This is fascinating to me for a number of reasons because I am curious about how much story versus how much teaching happens inside of books and like how much teaching versus how much story happens inside of courses. Uh, if you, if it was possible to put a number on it ratio wise, uh, how, how might you describe, uh, the ratio in books, nonfiction? I, I feel like it is different for every book okay. slightly. Um, what I do find is that particularly with transformational nonfiction, like we don't do a lot of simple how to, 
you know, we're not doing like how to use this tech program kind of books, right? Okay. It's more about let's make a change in your life. Let's increase your impact. Let's educate you about compassion and medicine. It's a great book we have coming out uh, called The Compassion Remedy. Um, and most of the time, these types of teachings come in some way or form out of the author's personal experience. And so we tend to kind of build more story into the beginning of the book so that it, it does three things. It creates that emotional resonance. It establishes the author as the expert because not only do they know about it, but they've actually lived through it in some way, shape, or form. And it creates the sort of page turner capacity, right? Information by itself is neutral. And even people who love information love it for an emotional reason. Even if that emotional reason is, I like being smart. <laughs> nice. That is a compelling reason to assimilate information. I'm going to hold my hand up on that one. I like being smart. I like knowing things. It's important to me. Enneagram 5, for those of you who know, 5 by 4. <laughs> so I want to be special and I want to be smart. And sometimes that's enough. But for most people, we're so battered. For those of you who can't see what I just did, I just smacked myself in the head with that <laughs> weird fart sound I just made. Um, we're so battered with information that we're really only going to be able to assimilate that which is emotionally important to us. And if our, if as writers, as authors, we can't create that degree of like that feeling of friendship, of of connection of validity to the relationship at the beginning of the book, then the rest of the information will land. I'm sure we've all had the experience where we're, we've read three chapters of a book and we're like, yeah, I'm going to get all I can get out of this, right? Um, that's something that I don't think needs to happen. But the long story short, front-loading story is often important. And then when we get to the more process-oriented or method-oriented chapters, the story portion can become shorter. So my method is built around, well, there's numerous like three-point arcs within it. First of all, we're looking at the hero's journey and the three-point plot arc, right? So at the beginning, we're meeting the hero. We're figuring out what that hero looks like, who, who they are, uh, what they're doing. And a lot of times in nonfiction, that hero is actually the reader. We're meeting them exactly where they are. I always use Bilbo Baggins and The Hobbit as a reference because almost everyone knows that story. So like when we meet Bilbo, he's just Bilboing around the Shire and he's doing his thing. Um, and we're meeting him and we're seeing that he feels limited, but he doesn't really know why. And then obviously Gandalf and the dwarves show up and like, that's the author, right? Gandalf is the author. I have a solution for you, but you have to say yes. And we do all of this through story that we're going to say, come on this journey. with me." The second point, like to part two is the actual journey. Like, here's my five-step method. I'm going to take you through the mountains, through the forest, we're going to slay the dragon, and then you've learned everything that you need to know. Part three is when the hero comes back home, when we as the hero have learned this massive thing that's going to change our lives in this book. And we wake up in the morning and we're back in our everyday lives, and we're different because now we have this information, but everybody else is the same. So, that's what we need the story to do. The information as presented at different points in the three-point plot arc is to support the transformation that's happening emotionally for the reader. There's also sort of three parts within every chapter of a book, and that's story, discussion, and instruction. Ooh. So when we're front-loading story, the discussion is really more of a reflection on Where's Bilbo? What's he doing? Right? No. Like we're meeting the reader where they are. What problems are they having? What's the evidence that their problem exists? What's the solution that we're presenting? And then as we get further into the book and we're looking at the author's methodology, the story becomes shorter, the discussion becomes longer, and the instruction might be different. We might be asking them to do certain exercises or journal on certain reflection questions. Or maybe the instruction is simply see this differently, think about this differently. And then as we get closer to the end of the book, the story shrinks even more. The discussion may shrink a little bit, but we're leaving the reader with instructions on how to troubleshoot being this new version of themselves in a world that still looks the same. 
Ooh, this is fantastic. I love that framework. You said it was a, a story, discussion, and instruction. instruction. Story, dis discussion, instruction, SDI. Okay, got it. It has some parallels between, uh, between a framework uh, that we use internally uh, to be able to teach our clients um, how to uh, create courses. It's called the RISE framework, and it stands for uh, results that they can see. Uh, the second one is ideas that make the results stronger. Then the S stands for stories that strengthen the ideas. And then the last are exercises to engineer results. It's like the, 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 the E of our framework maps <laughs> to the I of what you just shared. And then the stories, uh, of course, is like a, a direct uh, mapping uh, there as well. Uh, but if I had to, if I had to say, when it comes to courses, we're a lot more heavy on the instruction naturally because it's a course, uh, and story exists for the purposes of making sure that the instruction is received and understood, um, and uh, better implemented, uh, so to speak. But then we also go a little bit deeper and we say that within the courses there are like three kinds of stories uh, that we want people to experiment with hero stories anti-hero stories and villain stories um <laughs> there's a whole other conversation that we can have there for the transformational um non-fiction authors are they always telling hero stories is are would you say there are villain stories in there anti-hero stories all of the above how does that shake out that's a great question. I love your framework, by the way, and I think it's beautiful. Video is such an amazing medium because so much of the story element um, comes in from people simply watching the creator, mm. watching them be who they are, hearing the tone of their voice, right? So much of the backstory that we need to build in books because of the medium is done simply by people showing up on camera and being who they are, and that's amazing. Um, in terms of hero, anti-hero, villain, I think about it more in terms of how do we tell a story about a time where the author or a client was in a place that is energetically resonant and matching to mm. where we know the reader to be. Yep. So it could be any one of those, uh, right? If it's a book about um, you know recovering from addiction, for example, it would definitely be an antihero story. Like we would see the author if they if they struggled with that, we would see them in the depths of that because that's where their readers are or have been. Um, however, from the perspective of, um, for example, I I just we just released a book uh, called Why Women Aren't Winning at Health, and it's uh, two doctors and uh, yeah, so um, two doctors and the founder of a, a precision medicine company. And the stories there were about the author's various experiences about being women in a global medical system, mm -hmm. not necessarily even from the perspective of their expertise, although that was built in, but their experiences as women. And so hero, anti-hero, villain, well, you know, it was, um, it maybe wasn't as clear as all that, but it was a question of meeting the reader where they are. And so that's, I always just approach it from, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. I do think it's helpful to have people see um, stories of what happens when you do what I tell you, meaning the author, like if you do what the author tells you, this will be the result. And if you choose to completely ignore this advice, like, oh, or maybe that might be the result. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I'd, I'd have to really think about that. I, I like that question. I think if I uh, if I approached it from that direction, we might get some good stuff going in there. It's fascinating because for me, the I love the teaching uh, and uh, a spark discussion sparks that happen through the lens of heroes, anti villains, and uh, sorry, heroes, uh, anti heroes, and villains. And with heroes, the thing that I share, it's like the hero is basically an allegory for for us if we have the abilities the superpowers already inside of us and we have not yet answered the call to action you know it's like superman is has absorbed 
you know, um, all of this power from the sun, but he, you know, struggling to, you know, has this internal conflict. That's the thing that's holding him back from realizing his superpowers. You know, it's not any of the extra, he's got the capabilities. It's all in the mind. And it's like, he has to then master the mind, you know, his own philosophy and everything for him to become his fully realized self. And so it's not a lack of ability. It's actually within the realm of motivation. That's the part that he has to figure out. And that sometimes seems to be the part that people need to figure out uh, if they're on the cusp of writing a book or creating a course. It's like, yeah, you do have a book inside of you. Yes, you do have a course inside of you if you're willing to answer the call. You know, the abilities exist, but do you have the motivation to go the distance and make it a reality? Um, essentially, is how my brain goes to, uh, with that part. I love that. And, you know, obviously that has major ties to the hero's journey. I also think it's a question of timing. Mm. You know, um, there's a reason that in all of our favorite stories, the heroes are of a certain age and they have a certain set of life experiences. So many of the times they're like between 16 and 25. Like they they know enough to like not die in the wilderness, but they also aren't so conditioned to certain elements of society that they're not willing to go against that, where they're, they, they're, their beliefs sound so cemented that they're not willing to try something new. Um, you know, so much of great fiction is is really looking at a very certain age group, and I think that's really fascinating. Mm. I think for authors and course creators, it's really, are you developed in your ideas, not, you know, by chronological age or by years in business, but are your ideas developed to the point where you can wield them as tools mm. to go out and create change. That is one reason why I very, very rarely, I'm not going to say never because I have I have done projects like this and they've been amazing, but very rarely do I work with people who are like, I want to write a book to start my business. Like, no, no, you don't because your ideas have not been road tested. You don't even know if your sword is sharp. You don't know how this is going to land with people. Um, and until you go out and actually practice and road test this, the idea is going to keep changing and developing. And the book that you write when you're starting your business is not going to be the book that you write when your business is successful. Yeah. And so I think timing, definitely timing. And I think, you know, you know you're ready when you begin to innovate mm. and really start to um, become, if not a disruptor, than a voice for evolution in your industry. There's a parallel there between book writing and course creation as well, because the thing that I found um, after working with like over a thousand uh, course creators, the thing I've seen, uh, the patterns of success tends to be those who have sharpened their expertise uh, to a certain degree. And I love the analogy there of a sword. You don't know if the sword is sharp yet. You know, and that, that just, that completely takes it home. And the interesting analogy uh, or parallel rather uh, to the course creation world is at like, for instance, we, we recently created this, uh, we call it the 10K course quiz and it shows people like, okay, are you ready to do this or not? Basically, because you, do you still need to spend more time fuel testing the thing uh, or are you ready to now package it and like get it out there into the world and one of the qualifiers uh, tends to be either the amount of testimonials slash case studies that they have produced for whatever subject matter area proof of results essentially uh, and then another being just time in the field um, like sharing and developing the expertise so I really like that analogy of, okay, well, is the sword sharp? <laughs> Sometimes we do need to sharpen the sword. Some people like to say, hey, anybody can launch a course. I'm like, yeah, anybody can launch a course, but will it be good? Will it help anyone? That's a different story. Exactly. And, you know, the ideas that we develop in our minds, the way that we first develop our core concepts and our teaching pathways, we develop them that way because that's how they work for us. Mm. And th that's how they work for our learning style. That's how they work for where we were when we first started engaging with the material. Yeah. The ways in which we see our material and our expertise 
are, I would say, rarely the way that our audience sees them. And when we really start to start to take the time to bring our ideas to an audience, to see what kinds of questions they ask, to see where there are holes in our theories that people have questions around. Until we do that, our idea hasn't gone through its maturation process. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, trying to, um, you know, I don't know. I always think about like giving the baby the torch in a barn, you know, um, that's, you know, it's not a good idea because, you know, the baby doesn't have, and this is not to call anybody a, a baby, but until you have the experience to know what is going to happen when you put your idea out there, then how could you create something that's meant to be of service without you actually leading it? So there's an engagement and a, and a development of ideas that happens when we're actually teaching them, actually presenting them. Mm -hmm. And the more we teach and present our ideas, the more we will hone in on what serves, what doesn't, what, um, what it matters to people, and frankly, what doesn't. I mean, I have experience, direct experience of this. I don't know if I shared this with you, Mark. Um, but in 2016, I was, um, I was freelancing as, a, as an editor and ghostwriter. And I put together this massive online course called Cover to Cover, How to Write Your Book in Eight Steps. Wow. And it did, it did pretty well. It did pretty well. And what I discovered in that process was that what I thought people wanted to learn was how to be really good writers. What people actually wanted was to be authors. And there is a difference. Oh, yeah. Huge difference. And what I found is that the things that I thought were important to teach people were important because they were important to me, because editing and making books beautiful was my job. But my clients and the people who were buying my course, they didn't want to be writers and editors. They wanted to get their books done so they could turn it over to an editor to make it great. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge huge learning for me. And I think it's something that affects a lot of people when they're first starting to look at writing their book or creating their course, mm -hmm. is that this is my expertise and it's going to be interesting to people because it's interesting to me. Yeah. But me being in my expertise is how I help people, but they don't always want the results that I have as an expert. They don't want to do what I do or become who I am. Yep. They want to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And so when I learned that, it was hard, you know, it felt like, oh my God, I put all this work in and it's not doing what I want it to do. It was very humbling. And I'm so glad that I went through it because it helped me change my entire approach to serve at a massively higher level. Mm, I love not just the story, but also the meta conversation that I've been noticing uh, that's happening. I've been noticing how naturally uh you tell visual stories to illustrate a point which is apropos considering that you write stories and put them in books so <laughs> the, the visual of the baby in a bar with a torch i can't get that out of my head <laughs> it's it's very it's very visual i'm, I'm 1000 percent a visual learner and the other uh meta conversation that I've been noticing that's happening is in response to an, almost any situation, I'm usually thinking of like a framework, which I guess is why I'm in like course land. Uh, but one of the frameworks uh, for being able to find out if an idea is ready or to bring an idea to market, we also have another framework that is literally the idea, but it's in an acronym, ideate, discover, experiment, accelerate. And First, you come up with the idea, of course, but then the discovery phase, which relates back to what you just shared, is uh, great. In the ideate phase, you got your own idea out of your head and onto digital paper to see if it makes sense to you and maybe a subject matter expert. In the discovery phase, you then go and see what your audience says about the idea. And then you get feedback. You get to find out what they say and you find out what they think. But then the experiment stage, you find out what they actually do because what people do and what they say are often two very different things. And totally different. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, humans can be the worst predictors of their own behavior. And then the accelerate stage is just, okay, well, 
create more uh, to see if we have like statistical validity, uh, uh, validity uh, so that we can then um, see if we have this idea that can well, scale, you know, to the world, uh, basically. I want to flip uh, to another uh, part of this conversation, which is uh, what happens after someone becomes a transformational uh, author, you know, in the nonfiction space. Uh, how do we get the idea out into the world? Yeah. So I see different facets of expertise, like bricks in a wall. And what you're doing as you become more successful as an expert and an innovator and eventually a thought leader is you're literally stacking bricks in that wall. The book is a big brick. It gives you a platform to stand on that will put you head and shoulders above most people in your industry. When it's done really, really well, then your book gets amazing feedback. It opens doors. It gets you on amazing podcasts. Mm. It wins awards. It gets you noticed by the people whose notice matters to your work. Mm. And yes, that is readers. And it is also something that makes you more likely to be able to open a door to connect and work with people who will in turn open more doors for you. So the way that I see the industry with, with fiction, right, the goal is to sell books. Like when you're a fiction author, like that's what you do. You're an author, you're selling books, books are what is making you money. For most nonfiction, transformational nonfiction authors, they don't want to be writers for their career. They have a lane of expertise. They have a thriving business. They have this change that they're being in the world. And so for me, the goal then is not purely book sales. It's how many people, it, people's hands can we get this book into that can open doors for you, the author. So we also need to look at the book market. Because people, you know, despite all everybody's fears around, oh, books are going to die and nobody does long form content anymore. That's bullshit, quite frankly. Books are being consumed at a higher rate than ever before, particularly since the pandemic. Mm. And paper books still outsell ebooks for. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. So, but it's true. Cool. Audiobooks are also an, a high up and coming share of the market, but they're not dominant. Mm. So, that said, in 2021, there were 2.2 million books published, of which about 1.8 or so million were self-published or published non-traditionally. Hmm. And I consider myself a non-traditional publisher because I'm not taking rights and royalties from my clients. We are a service provider and not we're not purchasing people's IP. I think it's an important distinction. Um, and so, you know, if you look at maybe the turn of the century, right? Year 2000. There were probably about 500,000 books published. So yes, people are reading more, but the market is highly saturated. So do people still have, you know, books that sell a million copies or, you know, five million copies? Sure. Are those unicorns? Yes. For most people, selling that many books is not a lucrative or reasonable marketing strategy. Instead, I would rather see my clients get their books into 10,000 hands of people who will buy from them, who will recommend them, who will mm. join them at events, who will invite them onto their podcasts, because that's going to create an ROI that is massively yeah. outweighs book sales. Yeah. And books to me in that way are a tool to connect with the hearts and minds of people who need your information. I also think that there's a groundswell component. So many people focus just on book launches. Like, oh, we got to do this whole thing for my book launch. And, you know, like your book's still going to be around six weeks after it's released. You know, it's not coming off the market. It's not going anywhere. And the best books, I think, take on a life of their own after a certain amount of time. And if you look at, you know, Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, right? It became a bestseller five years after it was released. <laughs> Like it takes time for people to actually consume the book. 
in order to start talking about the book, in order to start recommending that their friends read the book, in order to leave actual informed reviews for the book. Um, all of this takes time. And so for me, there's a long-term strategy involved in book sales. And it's really about, you know, during launch, when there's a lot of hype, Whose podcast do I need to be on? Whose audience can I tap into? How do I get the book initially into the hands of as many people as possible who need my information, who resonate with me, and who will eventually want to continue to engage with me? The long-term strategy is leveraging the book to open doors for greater and greater speaking opportunities, media opportunities, visibility opportunities. The book will be there as an asset forever. And so it, it becomes this sort of encapsulated package, this beautifully wrapped present of your expertise that you can then hand off to anybody that you meet, anyone that you encounter, anyone that you connect with and say, this is me, this is what I do. And again, there's that groundswell factor. So what I see happening for my clients is that six to 12 months after launch, they start getting the random phone calls. Hey, my friend told me I should read your book. Can you tell me more about your programs? Hey, you know, my daughter came across your book and I'd love to invite you to speak at our corporation. The magic starts happening and it accelerates. It becomes a snowball effect. But it's not going to happen with like, I'm going to do an Amazon bestseller launch for a week and then call it quits and never market my book again. Yeah. Um, and again, in order for all of this to work, I think this is a very important point to make. And I'm sure that you can say the same in the course world. The book has to be good. Yeah. It has to be a good book. And yeah. you would be amazed at how little that is considered in the book industry. It's like my biggest beef with the publishing industry is that people will tell you, it doesn't matter what's in the book. You just have to have a book. Only 10 to 20% of the people who get the book will read it anyway. Uh, yeah, but those 10 to 20% yeah. will never work with you if your book sucks. Yes. And nobody is telling this to authors. And quite frankly, my learning from what we talked about earlier is that it's not actually the author's responsibility to make the book great. It's mine. It's their publishers. It's their editors. Oh, wow. Authors are not experts in creating books. Yeah. They hire us because we are experts at creating books. Yeah. I tell my clients this all the time. Like It's your job to provide the material, to give me your all, to put your heart and soul into it, to be raw, to be vulnerable, to be transparent. Mm. But actually making the book good, that's what you hired me for. That's my job. And can people do it on their own? Absolutely. Does everyone have that skill set? No. But it's something that is so rarely talked about in the publishing industry, but it makes all the difference. No one's going to tell your friends about their book if it didn't do anything for them. Yeah. You know, and I, I think it's just a huge disservice to authors to not talk about that because it's not a judgment about the quality of their ideas. It's a lack of good execution or good help in execution. Uh, there are parallels again between this and uh, creating uh, marketing and selling uh, a course uh, because there's so much emphasis in the online course industry around marketing and selling yeah. the course uh, and very little around the making the course actually good, uh, which is where a lot of my inspiration like for the last couple of years of just going deep on, on course development and just making sure that that was like rock solid uh, because coming at it initially from the sales side, I saw a lot of that, but I also had the personal lived experience of the very first online course that I took um, taught me the skills to be able to grow a website to 700,000 unique visitors. And I was like, oh my God, online courses are amazing. And then I came in with this positivity bias and then I then found a lot of courses that were not that great. And then I was like, if I'm ever going to help anybody with this, I want for uh, courses to be amazing because I know that it can change lives in a much way that, in the same way that my life was changed when somebody decided to put their all into it. Um, but I really resonate with what you shared about there just not being a strong emphasis on making sure that the book's actually good. But I really, I haven't considered the distinction between it not being the author's responsibility to make the book good. Because again, like you said, they're not book creation specialists. Like they, they, they have their expertise and experience that they're trying to put into the format of a book. Um, I really like that. What 
would you then say to someone who is, they've listened to this and they're like, oh man, that sounds amazing. Yeah, I would love to have like that kind of impact. I, I'm willing to take the time to have that long tail uh, conversion happen. How long should I reasonably expect this process to take me? That again, depends on the author. But usually when we accept authors into our programs where they're coming in with no writing done, but a big idea, generally we like the writing process to take six to eight months and it's entirely guarded in in one-on-one -on -one partnership with an editor I see. Um, because it helps keep the, the initial writing from going off the rails. We also do a lot of ghost writing. And so again, six to eight months is a reasonable expectation with weekly or biweekly interviews. Um, plus assimilation of, of existing materials. And then from there, once a manuscript has come through the line editing stage, meaning that no, no more of the content's going to change, the language has been cleaned up, um, and we're ready to go into production, which includes technical edits and proofreading and, and a lot of cleanup. Um, generally, we like to have six months from that stage. So when people come in, we're looking at about a year to 14 months before they have their book in their hand and they're ready to launch. There are situations where that timeline can be extremely compressed. Um, you know, if people come in with ex existing writing and we're working with an existing manuscript as opposed to helping the author write it from scratch. Um, however, most of the time it's it's around that 12 month time frame. And that allows us to do everything that we need to do to make the book into its best self. Um, I have only once I uh, had an experience where I received a manuscript where I was like, oh, hell yeah, this thing is perfect. It's amazing. And we were able to shorten the timeline considerably. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to be rather draconian in my standards. And there are plenty of publishing companies out there who will take an existing manuscript and they will produce it, meaning they'll, you know, they'll clean up the typos, they'll typeset it, they'll create a cover, and an author can have a book in, you know, as little as three months, sometimes even less. Um, I prefer not to do that because if our name is going on it, I want it to be the best it can be. And that takes an evolutionary process. Mm. Um, but there there are timelines and services out there for everyone. And it, I'm not saying that there's any right or wrong way. The most important thing to me is that an author can feel, and I see this over and over with my clients, they can feel when the book has become the best expression of itself when it's become the thing that it was meant to be. And when we reach that stage, there is a clarity of ownership of their expertise, of ability to stand on this foundation stone that they've created in the book, a new way of seeing themselves as thought leaders of, wow, like I knew that I had something to say, but I didn't realize it was this good. Like mm -hmm. that happens all the time. Yeah. And I don't ever want to put anything out where our author doesn't reach that moment. Yeah, I do. Because then the marketing is easy. There's no doubt. There's no, oh, I don't know, you know, am I aiming too big? Like, how well no, this book deserves to be a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Of course this needs to be in the hands of XYZ celebrity. Like, there's no doubt that the book can hold that and that it becomes a vehicle for that level of impact and dedication. And... That's the most important thing to me. Can we get there? Mm. And we'll do it however long it takes, however many iterations it takes. Because that's the most, like, when you get there, you can trust that your mission is in, a, like, a safe container. Yeah. I really like that because, again, there's this parallel between what I've seen in many of my past clients as well. It's, 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 it's like halfway through the process. Uh, where there's a, I don't know if I should like launch a course. And then they, when they see what's inside of it, they've gone through the process and like, it's been refined and like, we, we've taken the diamond out of the rough. We've like cut it up, we've polished it. And they're like, oh man, yeah, I've got something that the world needs to know about. And then off to the races because they're, they're just, you need to know about this. And they will then push so hard and so fast to be able to get it into the hands of the right people. Uh, there's so many parallels in the creative process here that I uh, quite love so much so that I feel like we may need a part two to really like 
dive into uh, all of all of the goodness uh, that we have uh, gotten to here today, because I also want to be uh, respectful of your time. You've been very generous, and I only have like just a few more questions. Absolutely, let's go. This might be the the second hardest question of today's interview. If you were stuck on a desert island with one dessert for one week, which dessert would it be? And a black. Oh, man. I have to say it's not dessert. Mm. It's chai tea lattes. Huh. I, We've never gotten that response before. That's great. <laughs> I, don't, I don't eat dessert. I'm not really a dessert girl. I think ice cream is gross. Yeah. Um, dark chocolate. Yeah. Huh. Chai tea latte. I could drink them all day and I would never need dessert. That is fascinating. Never gotten that. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. I love it. Uh, and that is just the lead up to this next. Okay. Okay. Which means, oh gosh, you might not have an answer to this one then. Hmm. Chocolate chip cookies or oatmeal raisin cookies? Oh, hell yeah, oatmeal raisin. Really? Wow. Give it a chance. No. <laughs> Oh, this is great. It's great. This is great. Because I, I am in the I am in the oatmeal raisin clan. Um and it's, it's the guests are split like eighty twenty on this. Like it's twenty percent oatmeal raisin and like eighty percent chocolate chip. Like I, I I don't make the rules, but the last person I you know what? I'm gonna get all of the oatmeal raisin guests together and introduce <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> so we can get together. I think it'll be fun. Uh, but the uh, final question is, well, I lie. Second to last question. If you could go back in time to the start of independent publishing, what advice would you give to yourself knowing everything that you know now? I think it would simply be to trust the vision, mm. to trust my vision. Um, if I could go back to the start of independent publishing as a whole and give the world some advice, it would be that the quality still matters, even if the judge needs to change. Nice. I like that. I don't think there's any higher point that we could end on. And so my final question is, where can we find out more about you? Well, you can go to worldchangers.media. That's our website. And if anyone has questions, um, I don't have a, a free download or, a, or an opt-in gift. I prefer to meet people one-on-one. -on -one. So there's a, a button right on the homepage to book a call and get to know each other. So that would be my offer. Oh, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure and I'll be looking forward to the next one. Thank you so much. I absolutely just love speaking with you, Mark, and I, I love your vision and I love the incredible work that you're doing in the world. So thank you for everything that you are and everything that you bring. Hey, thanks for checking out the show. If you liked it, go ahead and hit the like button and also subscribe so you don't miss another one. It also tells us which ones that you like the most so that we can then do more interviews like that. If you want to go from idea to implementation though, especially if you're wanting to productize your expertise so that you can scale your impact on your clients and of course grow your business, then join our email list. There we're going to talk about how modern consultants can productize their expertise so that they can have a greater impact on the world around them and live life on their terms. If that's up your alley, I hope to see you on the other side. Talk soon.